Hey everybody, welcome to this sort of side episode <laughs> of my prep for the campaign for Curse of Strahd. I thought I might, instead of going through the campaign, because we haven't actually played our next session yet, I might go back through and just kind of go over the different prep uh, stuff that I've done for this campaign generally. I have my cup of coffee here, and thought I might just run through some of the things that I've done in the background that aren't necessarily for any particular session and that aren't usually the result of like me sitting down and working really hard, but like I'll, I'll do a little bit for, you know, like five minutes or something, and then I'll come back a little bit later in the day when I have a free minute and I'll do something on it. And so it's not really like a prep, uh, a consistent prep, um, you know, I haven't like scheduled a specific amount of prep time or something for it. It's just the, the, the product of a lot of different little prep, <laughs> little amounts of prep that I've done over the course of, uh, over the day and, uh, and over the weeks since I've really been thinking of this campaign. Okay, so on the right I have the Shadow Dark uh, doc, uh, file here, and uh, I have my premium Shadow Dark RPG, which I have kickstarted, and then the initial one that I got for free as well. Um, and then I have different supplemental rules that I picked up online. I have the screen sheets, uh, quick start set monsters, and stuff like that. And I keep this open usually when I'm playing so that I can jump to, I also have the PDF open. Uh, the books aren't out yet, obviously. Um, I will have the books <laughs> out on the table when, when they come out. But uh, until they're out, I use the PDF. Because um, we play online, my, my players and I, so it's it's convenient to have all this stuff right here. Uh, I always have this background map up as the background. It's helpful to just have it right there so that I can um, quickly move a thing aside and look, you know, okay, yeah, they're right there and moving around. So that's helpful for me to have. But then on the left here, this is where I have my real... Um, this is where I have my real Curse of Strahd, Legacy of Strahd, as I'm calling it, um, file. So the first thing I have is, I've mentioned this before, but I have this Van Richten's Barovian Bestiary. Um, and this is something that I just developed really quickly, uh, copied and pasted while I was listening to some music. Um, this doesn't really count as prep. It's more just like <laughs> an excuse to listen to music and to, you know, uh, be doing something. But it has actually been, it's been helpful so far. Basically, um, I've numbered... I've, I've, I didn't want to use just the entire bestiary from Shadow Dark because there's some things in there that I just don't think fit in this world and some things that I don't want to include in this campaign. And so I basically um, filtered it all. And I went through this and I just took out the um, took out the creatures that I really wanted and put them in here. I put, kept the description of them, often changed it slightly, simplified their stat blocks just a little bit so that you know um, they could fit in a, in a line or two. Um, very often didn't need much simplification at all. Um, and then um, I divided them into the different groups. So there's beasts, humans, um, and because this is a human-only campaign, that, that title is fine, humans. <laughs> uh, magical creations, um, monstrous beings, and then undead, and then finally I have vampires. Uh, with the Y, of course. <laughs> um, so, um, what I think um, I like about this is that I've numbered them all so I can, when I'm writing down my notes elsewhere, I can just put, like, the number next to whatever I want it to be, and then I know where to look. And it just helps me keep a, a handle on what actually is in the world so that there's a consistent... Uh, I homebrew a lot, and I'll modify creatures on the fly, and I will change stats, and I will do things even um, right before a session. And so I... I, I didn't want to do that so much with Shadow Dark. I do that with 5e because <laughs> I, I kind of have to, right? With 5e, you have to homebrew and homebrew and homebrew and homebrew to get that game into a playable state at your table to fit what your particular style is. That's fine. And it and it can handle a lot of homebrew, which is why it's so versatile and why so many people like it, I think, that in marketing. But the um, the, the thing about Shadow Dark is that I, I wanted to try to play it much more as is, at least from the creature side of things and with the DC set and all these things. I didn't want to modify those. I wanted to play it much more, you know, um, rules as written. And so I, I want to keep the creatures consistent. So when I'm describing a creature in my notes, I'll give it a stat block or I'll give it a, a, a note of where it is in this little document so that I don't have to, first of all, I don't have to have the PDF open and go to it every time. But I can just link to this and I know exactly where it is. And then also the creatures that I use will be consistent because they're going to be in this book. I'm going to draw from it, and, and hopefully that'll show off, uh, come across for the players too, because as they encounter these creatures, they will um, start to start to learn them because they are, they're all unfamiliar with Shadow Dark, and so like 
when they fought um, the ghoul, for example, and it had 11 AC. They didn't know that. They didn't know how many AC. They're used to 5e. And so the one player has DM'd for 5e for years. And so for him, he was like, I rolled an 11, I miss. And I was like, actually, that hits precisely. He was like, oh, interesting. So they don't know these creatures yet, and they don't know what's possible. And so as they play, they'll learn them, and I'll make sure that they're consistent here. Okay, so this is the first document I put together. It didn't take me too long. Again, it was just kind of on the side. I'll close that one up. Um, something else I, I, I did was I wrote this, like, background for me. Um, but most of this is no longer true. <laughs> uh, some of it is. But basically, this was, like, my first draft of the story, and I kept it here because um, I, um, I just haven't gone through and, and, and organized it. My, like my whole overall story isn't set because I, I know the broad strokes, I know the NPCs and I know what they want, but I don't tend to prepare more than like two or three sessions ahead in terms of like events happening. And so I don't know a lot of these details might change and suddenly I'll have to make this character or that character's brother, you know, or remove this character entirely because they're not going that direction and take his motivation and give it to someone else because that's how I want to keep that motivation in the game still, and it's it's one of the important ones. But they're not going to see that guy, you know. So I, I I'm trying to keep things flexible. Um. And uh, like for here, here's one thing that's just no longer true. Irina was captured and taken to the castle. She can be rescued by a careful party. That was something that I had initially thought that they'd come to Barovia and Irina would already be gone, and Ismark would be you know in a, in a feverish state and and freaked out about how to get her back and not know what to do, and they would have to try to help him. So that was. I, I ended up moving away from that because I wanted them to have a personal connection to Irina, and I also wanted them to um, not have to immediately move on from Barovia, which I think if they ran into Ismark and he was like, help me, my sister, my sister has been kidnapped, help me, help me, help me, they'd probably just leave. And in my experience, that's actually, I've, I've run the beginning of Curse of Strahd for 5e a couple times, and that's pretty much what almost always happens, is that they get to the town, they have the letter from the Burgomaster, they go to their, Irina's right there, and they're like, get me out of here. And so they leave like that day or maybe the next day, maybe. So anyway, this document is, is just a background and it's still not, it's not entirely true. It was like a first draft of the story, but I have it here still. I haven't gone through it again and redone it. I came up with this document for a few, um, uh, the last time I ran Curse of Strahd, um, which I didn't get very far. We got like three sessions in <laughs> for, we were doing 5e. And, um, and just the group didn't, didn't mesh well. It was a different group of people. But I kept this background here, uh, you know, men, last name Adovich, women, last name Adnia. Uh, and then uh, if I wanted to develop a first and last name, then I have random professions and uh, character traits. So you can roll a d8, and then if you want, you can roll a d3, or you can just pick, right? Say, oh, he's afraid and uh, abusive, or he's religious and guilt-ridden, and just call it that. I usually give two. And, uh, you know, it's fine if you roll the same thing, because you can always just pick the second entry or third entry. Curious, precise, or pretentious. They're all very different. Yosef uh, Pavlovich, Palava, Palovich. Yeah, Yosef Palovich, if that was, if you rolled a 12 and a 3 for his name. Or, uh, yeah, so it, it works. You can come up with NPCs really quick, quickly this way. So uh, I've done that. I've had these, uh, these sort of uh, documents open. So far, they haven't run into any random person, but uh, it'll definitely, especially when they get to Balaki, I'll need, definitely need this open. Um, and then I had this random encounter table, which I never really finished. Um, it was okay. It was honestly not my, <laughs> not my, not my favorite thing that I've ever developed. So it's okay though. I mean, like I, I was using the underclock die, uh, which is, um, I forget where I found that online. Uh, it's a really cool idea. And I, I would do it for a dungeon crawl, I think, rather than the standard random encounter. And I kind of modified it a bit, but it just doesn't work for, for Barovia. In my experience, um, random encounters, I don't know. I, I might still simulate random encounters as we go, but I don't think I'm actually going to um, stick with it. Certainly when they get into like a dungeon, dungeon, I might do random encounters. If they go to Ravenloft, I'll do random encounters. And, and I'm, but I might have more like set encounters when they travel from place to place. I think I'll just do that. Maybe I'll roll them up ahead of time and then make sure that they fit. That's probably what I'll do. Rather than have, like, roll at the table. Uh, 
Okay, so this was just a, some of it's cool, some of it's just literally just grabbing random stuff um, online or, you know, so, but, there, but there are some interesting things here that I think would be kind of cool, like a pair of Barovians offering a sacrifice to the Lady of the Woods. This is Baba Saga. I think that could be cool. Maybe they will run into something like that, but I'll come back to this if I ever need it. Um, this was the, uh, I got this from, uh, I got this from uh, one of the um, Monster of the Week by um, Kelsey over at uh, Arcane Library. And uh, I, I renamed the file Strahd von Zarevich because I liked it, but it's actually Lord Hedron Antioch, who was her vampire that she developed for uh, that mo Monday Monster of the Week. And I, I took this stat block as the basis for Strahd, but then I buffed it up a bit. And I know it's already pretty strong. It's level 12, and it's it's hard. But I wanted the Strahd to be a sorcerer. So if he comes back, which isn't actually guaranteed, I think he will come back. But I didn't keep this backstory either, but I got the stats, and then I added some things uh, so that he's slightly harder, uh, I think, Strahd is going to result in at least a character death or two when they fight him. And I'm okay with characters dying in the final boss fight. I think that'd be kind of cool. Um, so he'll be tough. He'll be tough, but hopefully they'll be level 8 or 9 by the time they get there. Well, we'll see. Maybe a little lower. Um, then I have some some pieces of art here, which I liked. Uh, here's the Sp old Spallage Road, so when they go leave Barovia and head through the woods, I'm going to show them this, because I try to show them pieces of art as we play. Um, I think it's it's nice to give them something. Um, and the same thing with this. This was what I showed them when they were in the East Spalish Woods as they were coming through with their coach. This is what was up while they were uh, fighting the wolves. Um, and then I have my different uh, documents here. So I have art for inspiration. I got this from, uh, oh gosh, what's the uh, artist's name? Um, I forget, but she's really good and it's really creepy art. Um, and I, I don't think I'm going to, um, Iron Horrors. Yeah, Iron Horrors, that's right. Um, I don't think I'm going to actually use any of these pieces of art like at the table. I'm not going to like show the players any of these pieces. But they're great for me. Um, they're really terrifying. But they have that kind of whimsy to them, which I really like in art. Um, and uh, again, I think that these are just really creepy, really excellent pieces of art that uh, capture the sort of um, sort of vibe of uh, my prep work, at least, especially this one. I think this one's awesome. Super, super creepy. <laughs> With the bats. I found it terrifying. So I'm going to keep that in my mind, and I'll probably try to describe things like that. But I don't think I'm going to show them any of those pictures at the table, because um, I've been showing them more like, realistic art. One of the things that I do here is I'll have uh, character art. So I have, like, um, different characters for the various places already picked out. Like I have Stella Vokter already picked out, and I, I went online and I just found pieces of art for everybody. Uh, some of the bribes, although it's not showing up. Um, but then I have like all the random NPC portraits, and I like having these on hand. So that way I can, um, if I need, right, I can take one of those character names and I can, the random character names, and then I can throw it together with an NPC portrait. And uh, then, then I'll have it at the table right there. So that's that's something that I think is, is pretty nice. That way they'll, They'll have character art as well as a name, and so random NPCs won't necessarily feel like a random NPC because I'll have art for them. Um, so far, I've had art for every NPC they've encountered, um, except Maud. I didn't show them Maud, and I realized that was actually a mistake. Uh, I described her, but I didn't show her. I should have gotten a piece of art for her. Well, oh well, say lovey. Um, anyway, I think this is kind of cool. I, I went through and found good art that I found online, and then I have people for Kresik too. And, um, all right, so that's the character art, art for inspiration. Um, I'll start from the right here. I have world building. So this is this is more accurate world building stuff. This stuff, when I put it into this file, it's actually true. So I have the history of Strahd von Zarevich, and uh, it's sort of written in the style of a, uh, uh, I don't know, you know, a, a biographer or something like that, and I have it all. But then I have this last bit, which is not <laughs> written in that style at all. Um, and then I have basically where he came from. How does Strahd come to be? And I think that's an important thing to, um, to understand about your villain. Why is that villain the villain? Even if he's not uh, currently active in the world, and I don't know much else about him. I know his stats, and I know his history. But I'm not sure exactly yet what he wants. But he hasn't returned yet. He wants return. I think he wants vengeance and things like that. But. 
And then this is a document I actually gave the players. It's it's essentially like an in-world journeyman's account of this part of the land. It's essentially like one of those travel di uh, di diaries that used to be published in the 17th, 16th, 18th centuries. People would travel around Europe or around the world and they would recount things about uh, about the places they traveled. And I wrote it in that style about Barovia so that the players would have kind of a sense going in of what the place was like because their characters would have a sense, but only a passing sense, right? Like they may have heard of it. And so this was kind of it, but that maybe, maybe the more educated characters had read this and the less educated characters had, had, had learned this stuff on their own. And so I talked about the, the description of the valley, and that way they kind of get a sense of, of how big the land that they're talking about is, and its political relationship, and what kind of kingdom it's a part of, and, and how it's loosely connected with that, and then, again, the geography, and then, like, the local produce, just so they can get a sense, again, of really, like, what this land is like. It's only, it's only two pages, it's, but it's, you know, 1,500 words, so it's not too long, hopefully, they, and, and they all read it. And I talked about some of the superstitions here. Uh, some of the, the, the habits, um, how they don't like inviting people into their home. In fact, they won't do it. You have to step across the, the threshold before they will invite you, before they will greet you. Um, and it's a holdover from the time when when uh, Dracula, or <laughs> not Dracula, <laughs> right? Strahd von Zarevich was um, ruling the land and, and his, his minions, especially his most powerful minions, couldn't enter your house unless you invited them, right? The vampires. And so they, they have that tradition that that superstition still and so um and it's interesting so far the players haven't noticed it but some players so like Ma mary invited them in right away ismark hesitated the doctor invited them right in right away but ismark hesitated when he invited them and he, he didn't he he holds to the superstitions of his town but he is the burgomaster and he figured okay well i gotta let them in so he invited them in because they weren't coming in but uh but especially once they get to Velaki, it's going to be a sort of an indication right if they pick up on it, the player, the, the the Barovians who are most superstitious or who are perhaps most clued in, will not invite them in. Whereas those who are maybe uh, not so worried about Strahd or for for you know because they don't believe in him or because they want him, will be the ones that more invite him, will invite the players in. And so they might pick up on that. It might be a, a little subtle way of seeing who is uh, who's on which side in some sense. And then there are other things about the Bistani, the evil eye, and how you're not supposed to look them in the eye. And I'm going to make the evil eye, the Bistani curses, way more usable than they are in Curse of Strahd. Like, they're going to use them and give them dis disadvantage and all this stuff. Um, curse with a look. And I talk about them and, and Sipopa, which is, I took that from uh, Hot Springs Island, I think. But it's something that the, the Vistani sell. It's a drug, basically. I replace, basically, it's replacing the dream pastries. I don't like that. I think that's super creepy. I don't like grinding up kids bones that's just not my thing i don't want that in the game so um taking that out but i'm fine with drugs evidently <laughs> so i'm adding in uh this this narcotic sopopa basically it's like you know opium or something like that and it it, it dulls them and so people are a lot of people are, are giving into that and it, again it's not the hags that are doing that it's uh it's the vistani or at least some of them and uh and other vistani of course don't like it hate it um Talked about uh, being lost if you leave Barovia, um, and uh, the religions and the, the relics and the holy symbols that are everywhere, um, but also how it's a lot of superstition and stuff like that. So anyway, I think this is a really cool document, and it gives them a sense of each of the towns, Barovia, Velaki, and Kresik, and it just a brief, brief description of what each is. And so they, they know, again, like what the difference is between the three towns and why you might go from one to the other. The, the Abbey of St. Markovia is near Kresik. Um, Velaki is the seat of the count, um, and the, I'm calling him the count, uh, Vargas Velakovich. And uh, Barovia is the oldest of these towns, and it's underneath the Ravoni Raska, which is the Spires of the Raven, or Raven Loft. Um, Ravoni Raska. Anyway, and then I have a couple um, Barovian sayings and Barovian isms. Um, and then I have this, which is literally just a few notes, <laughs> languages right now. Uh, because some of my people are from Duskwall, which is taken from Blades in the Dark, um, I they were like, where are we from anyway? Where was the city where the cult first caught Arthur and where we met? met? And I was like, uh, Duskwall. <laughs> so that's that's for their Duskfall. Um, and then a couple of my players are from the colonies, which is their piece of speaking colonial, and then Imperial is the language of the land, and then two of them are from Duskwall, so they speak Mastrin, and then um, Barovian is the language of the land. So I, I, none of them speak Barovian. And I, that was intentional. I didn't want them to be able to talk to everybody. Um, there's this feeling of isolation that they already have. Like they can't really talk to some people and they're like, we have to find people to help us talk to them. And I think that's actually cool. 
So then I had session zero player stuff. There's equipment list, which is just literally an equipment list that I had changed. I used silver as the basis uh, instead of gold, um, silver and copper instead of gold and silver primarily. Um, and then I added these uh, some properties just to give them a sense of what that was, and so that they can how much they started with and how much they can carry, um, all that. And then uh, this was this document I've shared before, which is the session zero. So it's the roles, the backgrounds, uh, and then the new rules for the system. I don't have the classes on here. All right, and then I got the old modules. So I got uh, the old Ravenloft, um, you know, uh, for I think this one's third edition. Yeah, Wizards of the Coast, D20, third edition, Ravenloft, A World of Dread. Just to get us, you know, again, there's um, background information that I wanted to see and it, to see what I wanted to take and stuff like that. And it's it's kind of cool. Um, I I like comparing it to the 5e Curse of Strahd because sometimes there are things that are the same and then there are things that are very different. And it's interesting to see what they kept and what they changed. And perhaps to speculate on why. But then I have the original. Uh, good old I6, um, Ravenloft, uh, Master of Ravenloft is having guests, guests for dinner and you are invited. Um, with the old cool maps of Ravenloft, I mean, this map is so iconic, right? It's one of the reasons why I honestly want to run this campaign so much. It's because I love the map of Ravenloft so much. Um, and and Barovia, this Barovia map is such a classic. I think it's gorgeous. And I'm using it, basically. I'm adding, I added uh, where E is, I added a... Uh, a house uh, that's Dr. Maxim's house, uh, but Mad Mary's. I also have somewhere on the over here on the east. But everything otherwise, the map is is the same. I kept it. Um, and then you know, I think it's really useful to have a lot of the. Uh, this has good ideas. Good ideas about how to run it. <laughs> this picture is so silly. <laughs> I love it. All right, so that's the old modules, and I kept them here just to reference and stuff. Um, and then I have this. This is the location details and art. So I have a whole bunch of maps that I found online for each of the places. The Wizard of Wines, Van Richten's Tower, a cool old player map of Barovia, which I actually don't think I want. I'm going to use this. When they find a map of Barovia, it will be this one with the prominent farms. Um, and then I have like you know bits of art, like the Kresik Vistani Camp, Baba Saga's Hut. Uh, but basically, this was like the first thing I did, was I gathered all, as many of the maps as I could find online and just put them down in here. And then I have the different locations. So I have uh, Velaki, which is, again, just maps right now, and art, which you can't really see. The Zerpool Falls, which I have character art for it now. I have the different characters, uh, the different Vistani that they might meet there. And then uh, a cool isometric map of the Zerpool, and then the other uh, map, and then a little description of it, which I'll come up with. Kresik is just one. Uh, I'm putting Old Bone Grinder by Kresik. I'm, I'm not putting it out east. I'm putting it out west. Uh, because I think the hags are dealing with the the uh, people out that way. I haven't yet settled on that, and it's, pl it's plenty in the future, obviously. And then I have Ravenloft. I have the maps of Ravenloft. Again, it's not showing up. I don't know why it's not doing that. Oh, well. And then I have Barovia Town in the background there. So I have... Um, I had a maps for the Blood of the Vine, and I had a dungeon level below it. This was, again, before I was really settled on what was going on. So I had the potential for them to go down into this dungeon below the tavern, which then opened up into like a cistern or into the tunnels. I got the idea of the cistern, but I don't think, yeah, the blood of the vine is, there's no way down there. I mean, maybe there is, but <laughs> that's totally not on the radar right now. Uh, then I had the Koyana house um, and surgery, but that was before I, I realized it wasn't the same place because I was going to make Ismark the doctor and I was mixing things up and I was changing, you know, it was, it was a flexible. So now it's just Dr. Maxim's, uh, but it was, it was sort of the Koyana house at first. Um, I wanted to separate the Burgomaster and uh, you know, Ismark and Irina. I thought they were separate, but then I realized, no, no, it makes more sense for them to be all the same. So I have the Burgomaster's Mansion, which is, uh, I used that map for there uh, when I, I didn't show them, but I had it as a reference when they were there. I'm not really doing maps that much. I don't want to do battle maps. Um, so I'm keeping more theater of the mind. I have a map of Inner Barovia, which are, or a picture of Inner Barovia. I have some pictures of Barovian houses that I've shared with them, the Bloody Crest that I shared with them. A map of Biltris, and then a Barovian house map in case they go into a random house. And it's a picture, it's Death House. But uh, And then I have Mad Mary's house, which actually this ends up not being Mary's house. So um, I have this as an additional separate house if they go into a random Barovian house as well. And then I have Bar Barovian NPC art. So I took Sorvia. Oh, Sorvia's here still, but she's dead. Uh, but I have everybody else. A lot of them are from the book. Um, and then some of them are things I found online. Um, so I have the characters. That whenever they whenever they interact with that person, I open it up, and then they have that art piece of art right in front of them the whole time. And then I have these three dungeons. Uh, I have I found a cool map 
uh, Manor of the Doomed, which is from uh, Dyson Logos. And I think this is my new death house if they ended up going to the, the cult's place. They can go out here and uh, I'll, have, I'll, I'll write this up, but they haven't so far bothered. And it has a, oops, it has a ground floor and an up, uh, like a dungeon level. So it's a big, it's a pretty big place and it's cool. It's, it's comparable to Death House, but I think it, I just like the map better. And there's more ways down and it's more of a traditional dungeon crawler. So uh, I might use that if they end up going to a cult, the cult's house, if they find it back there. And then I have a cistern, which is again another, um, another Dyson Logos map. Uh, I think the, the the well leads down like somewhere right here, and it's a big cistern. Obviously, this is not realistic. Like, there's just a big cavity under the town, and the town would collapse in a sinkhole, um, probably. But you know, it's fantasy. I can do whatever I want. So there's this big cavity under here, and there's it, it relates to an old ruin that used to be here and that sunk down, maybe or something like that. It was built down in this limestone can uh, cavern beneath uh, uh, beneath Barovia, and so that's where the well water is, but also. Uh, there's a, a place down here and maybe there's cultic activities, you know, so it's a cool little place if they end up doing it But I don't think they will but I have it just in case And then finally I have the church which I basically already showed I have the different uh, parts of the church and then the document and I don't know if they're gonna go back They haven't dealt with Donovich, but um, they uh, they did go back into the back of the, the narthex and the back of the nave and go into the sacristy and find the, the book of prayers so that's something all right, cool. Well, that's basically it. Um, this, again, is just sort of a side thing. I want to show you guys all the different documents that I have and go through it. Um, so I hope it's been interesting. Uh, the next prep video probably won't be until after our next session, which is on a Monday, so it won't be for a few days. But um, I wanted to get this out and just because uh, I'm feeling in the mood. So hope you guys all have a great week. See you then.